Welcome to all our guests that are here today and greetings to all our brethren around the world. We're enjoying a very beautiful day here in Charlotte. We've had enough rain to give us rich vegetation. We're about an inch and an inch and a half uh, over normal, or almost up to 30 inches accumulated for the year to date. Well, thank you, Mrs. Ellertson, for that uh, beautiful song, Pray On. This will be their last Sabbath here before Mr. and Mrs. Ellertson move on to Kansas City. So we want to give them our best wishes and bless, uh, ask God to bless them in their new move and their new assignment. Some years ago, when some of our members were still being pressured by our former association, I received a phone call from one of our members, Sally, who is not North Carolina. Um, Sally was being pressured by a relative or a friend, Gertrude, who attended our former association. Now, apologies to anyone named Sally or Gertrude. Gertrude told Sally, if you're not going to eat pork, then you're going to have to do everything the Old Testament says. You can't eat any pears from your pear tree until after seven years. Well, Sally, our local church member, was put on the defensive. She started backpedaling. She, did on, she honestly said that she didn't remember that in the Bible. And Sally told me that afterwards she felt really let down, that she had let God down for that matter because she didn't have an answer for this person who was pressuring her. Later, Sally was searching for the biblical statement and couldn't found, find it. I told Sally that Gertrude was trying to paint her in a corner of legalism. She was just trying to put her down and trying to put her on the defensive. Now, how would you handle such a situation? Would you be able to answer the question in upholding the truth? Would you be able to defend the faith? How would you answer some argument, particularly when you're not familiar with that, that specialized biblical point? Would you get all flustered? Would you feel that someone had solid proof that your foundational beliefs were wrong? How would you handle that situation? Well, frankly, if you have strong beliefs, whatever may at the moment seem to distract you or put you on the defensive, you won't be put on the defensive. You know there's an answer because you have a conviction and you have a foundational belief system in your character and in your mind that you know there's an answer. You may not have it at the moment, but you will have an answer. We need to ask ourselves just how strong are our beliefs and our convictions. Now, there's another way of answering Gertrude. You just tell her, well, thank you, Gertrude, for the call. Uh, I'll research your point. Or you might add that um, if I prove that it's for God's will for me, then I'll do it. Another way of answering is saying, I'm not familiar with that scripture, but I'll study into it. Well, let's take a look at the answer of that particular question. Leviticus, the 19th chapter. Actually, Gertrude was not accurate even in what she was saying. So don't assume that when someone is challenging you that that individual even has the facts. Leviticus, the 19th chapter, and verse 23. And when you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then you shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy, to praise the eternal therewith. And in the fifth year shall you eat the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the eternal your God. God says, whenever he says, I am the eternal your God, he is letting know his authority and his sovereignty to you and to whoever is reading his scriptures or hearing this word. So it's important to him. Now, I told Sally she didn't have to be an agricultural expert. In Big Sandy, Texas, where my wife and I lived for 12 years on the campus there at Ambassador College, the agricultural program experimented from 1963 to 1977. They tried to apply these agricultural principles to the actual ground and to the fruit trees and to the crops and the particular even applying the land Sabbath. 
And that program was especially blessed. Even one of the county agents came by and saw that the land had been totally uh, worked by cotton farming so that the land was virtually worthless before the program began. But 14, well, seven years later, after the land rest, the county agent came back, couldn't believe his eyes that here that land was so fertile and so prosperous. God's ways really work. Sally appreciated the counsel that she didn't have to know everything on the spot. The critics are trying to make you think that they found the lost brick, and if they pull out that lost brick, your whole spiritual house is going to fall down. Well, people have been trying for millennia to find the loose brick, and they haven't found it. Do you have a, your spiritual house in order? Have you built your doctrinal belief system on a sure foundation? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. There are many scriptures in the Bible that talk about building a house as symbolic of truth or of your belief system. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, and verse 11. We know that even in Ephesians 2.20 it says that the church of God is built upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So what is your foundation, your spiritual foundation? I won't turn there, but Jesus also gave the analogy of a house being built upon sand or being built upon a rock. That's in Matthew 7 verses 24 through 27. So we need to know what we believe. We need to prove to ourselves what is truth. And yes, we are all in different stages of belief or conviction. Some are new in the faith, and they're just learning. And it may take some time, as we heard in the sermonette, to come to a deeper conviction and understanding and to internalize that as a part of our godly character. Now, Sally was put on the defensive by Gertrude. Are you a defensive Christian? Or do you have the faith to answer a challenge? Do you have your Christian act together? Meaning that you have your belief and understanding pretty solidified in your mind. Let's turn to 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, writes the Apostle Peter, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That is, you are to answer with reverence and respect to everyone who asks you. The New King James says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you, and you do it with meekness and fear. The title of this sermon is, Always Be Ready to Give an Answer. James Bark William Barclay was the author of this book. He's written quite a few commentaries. We used to use this ambassador college in our course on the general epistles, which I taught uh, several times. William Barclay says this about 1 Peter 3 and verse 15 when he says we must be ready to give a defense and uh, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Barclay writes, it must be reasonable. It is a logos that the Christian must give and a logos is a reasonable and intelligent statement of his position. The Greeks had three basic principles, logos, pathos, or pathos, and ethos. A logos had to do with logic, pathos with emotion, um, ethos with credibility. And so he's saying, look, you need to have a logical reason. If you were in the Greek society and they were to ask you a question, you better have a reason for your statement or your principle. He goes on to say, as Biggs put it, he was expected, quote, intelligently and temperately to discuss matters of conduct. To do so, we must know what we believe. We must have thought it out. 
We must be able to state it intelligently and intelligibly. Our faith must be a first-hand discovery and not a second-hand story. Reminded me, of course, in some of my ambassador classes, and I would say, well, what, what do you believe, Johnny, about, uh, you know, the, uh, the last great day? And he might say, well, Mr. Armstrong taught us. Wait a minute, no. No, I asked, what do you believe about it? As he, as Barclay says, it must be a first-hand discovery and not a second-hand story. It is one of the tragedies of the modern situation that there are so many church members who, if they were asked what they believe, could not tell, and who, if they were asked why they believe it, would be equally helpless. The Christian must grow through the mental and spiritual toil, the mental and spiritual toil of thinking out his faith so that he can tell what he believes and why. The Apostle Peter says, yes, we need to be ready to give a reason, a logos, a reason for the hope that lies within us. So now how do you get ready to answer? How do you get to answer your faith and state your faith and describe your faith? Well, there are many scriptures that tell us that we are to talk often with one another, we're to exhort one another. One simple practical way is to ask questions at the dinner table. Some of the very famous politicians, President Kennedy, for example, and others, uh, when they were growing up in their families, they would discuss international politics because John F. Kennedy's father was, of course, ambassador to England at one time. And they would discuss at the table those issues. We should be able to discuss at the table some of the issues of God's fundamental beliefs. You can ask your children, for example, what is God like? And some of the answers we receive from children are sometimes very inspiring, sometimes very humorous. But answer, ask some of the basic questions. What is the Bible? Who is God? Why keep the Sabbath? Now these may sound like simple questions, and yet 99% of the world's population can't answer these questions. And there was a large majority of those who supposedly knew the answer at one time to these questions who apostatized, who fell away. Did they really know the answer to these questions? We need to speak often one with another. Malachi tells us that. Malachi, the third chapter, starting with verse 16. A very inspiring section here. God says he really is looking out for his children and those that do exhort one another, encourage one another. Malachi 3 and verse 16. Then they that feared the eternal spoke often one to another. And the eternal hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the eternal and that thought upon his name. Yes, they spoke often one to another. And they shall be mine, verse 17, says the eternal of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son that serves him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. We need to be convicted, and of course, as we heard in the sermonette, we need to live by every word of God. How else, then, are we getting prepared to answer? Well, in Spokesman Club, for example, men are challenged. Uh, Proverbs 27, 17, you might turn there, is one of the key principles that is applied in Spokesman Club. Mr. Basil Wolverton, of course, was a cartoonist who, who actually drew one of the uh, cartoon pictures to uh, symbolize the very principles on each of the pages of the original uh, Spokesman Ambassador Club. And I uh, hope you get to see some of those cartoons sometime. But Proverbs 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. We need to expose our thoughts and ideas to others, to the others who have wisdom and those who have experience. Turn to Proverbs, the 18th chapter. There are those who have come up with the weirdest, way-out ideas, 
because they have gone off and isolated themselves from being cross-examined, if you will, or being sharpened by their friend, or being tested by others in the community. And they have gone way off. And we're warned right here in Proverbs, the 18th chapter, through desire a man having separated himself seeks and intermeddles with all wisdom. Or as it is in the New King James, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. And many people who were kept on the right path because they were in the community of the faithful have gone off in their own little isolated communi uh, communities and they argue against all wise judgment. They've lost the truth. They've lost the trunk of the tree. So don't, brethren, ever isolate yourself from God's guidance, from His church, from His ministry, or from His people. He who separates himself seeks his own desire. He quarrels against all sound wisdom, as it says in the NASB. And some ministers have isolated themselves. and They no longer have the multitude of counsel. And they no longer have the full counsel of God, which is, of course, one of our mission statements that we are striving to do. Turn to uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. If we're to give an answer for what we believe and our hope, we need to know what we believe. 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verse 15. Paul writes to Timothy, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We heard an exhortation in the sermonette that we need to know God's Word. Uh, Mr. Ellison asked, how long will it take to read through the Bible? I've shared with you one time and that I had a one-year reading program in the back of my New King James Bible, and I completed it in a year and a half. So sometimes it may take a little longer than whatever program you may have. But nonetheless, you will benefit from it. You need to read the Word of God. You need to know what you believe because, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished, or equipped unto all good works." the telecast I just taped this last week, The Battle for the Bible. I was bringing out how Harold Linzel in his book, The Battle for the Bible, had pointed out example after example after example of the seminaries in the United States where the directors of those seminaries and the students of those seminaries do not believe this verse. They well, some of it might be inspired, that that has to do with faith and uh, with doctrine, but the, hist the history is, can be incorrect and um, other uh, scientific ac aspects of the Bible may be wrong. No, all Scripture is God-breathed. Again, the Greek is theonoustos, and in the NIV it's translated God-breathed. And if the Scripture is God-breathed, we have a responsibility to know it and to respond to it. So we need to know the Bible. Let's turn back to Hebrews uh, 6, verse 1. And, of course, that gives us great confidence when we look at the Bible. There are, of course, copying editor, edits and uh, mistakes and uh, going from the original autographs to the um, other translations. But God inspired, as is the basic doctrine, the original autographs, that uh, he used through his ministers, his prophets, and his servants who wrote the scriptures. Here in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, we have the foundational scriptures, the foundational doctrines, that is, of the church. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again. And now we list the six basic doctrines. The foundation of repentance from dead works is one faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. The seventh is actually going on to perfection on that basis of those six basic doctrines. That's God's plan of salvation for you. 
And of course, he makes his plan well known through the annual holy days and through the weekly Sabbath. But have you studied those basic doctrines? Do you know what they are? Do you believe them? And are you convicted of them? And are they a part of your spiritual household, your spiritual character? Now, to help you, of course, in your studies, the church has published and put out the Living Church of God official statement of fundamental beliefs. I hope all of you have a copy of this, and I hope all of you have read it. If you haven't, certainly check with me or Mr. Davis or someone at the office, and we'll try to get you a copy of this. But this will help you to understand the basic fundamental doctrines of God's church. The Council of Elders worked on this for quite a long period of time and with uh, much discussion, and we all agreed on the particular final copy of it. That doesn't mean this is a document written in stone. It means that it can be developed, it can be added to, it can be modified, but it's basically very solid and agreed upon by the Council of Elders and Mr. Meredith and the uh, leading ministers in God's church. So most of us know the fundamentals. We know our mission, and the mission of the church is also stated in here. We have a sevenfold mission that Mr. Meredith has articulated, and that's on our website at lcg.org. So I hope you will look on the website to see what that mission is. Also, in the upcoming September-October LCN, Living Church News, we encourage you to read Mr. Lambert Greer's article, We Are Not All the Same. You often hear among the 300, or maybe not all 300, but uh, dozens of Church of God groups where we're all the same. There are distinctives. There are differences. And I encourage all of you to read Mr. Greer's article when you receive your LCN, September-October issue, we are not all the same. There are some major differences among some of the groups. And some groups have gone uh, off the radar screen as far as that is concerned in terms of biblical doctrine. But know what you believe. As Barclay said, quote, the Christian must go through the mental and spiritual toil of thinking out his faith so that he can tell what he believes and why. So how can you give, be ready to give an answer? Well, you can write your own I believe paper, your own fundamentals of belief. But if you've really lived God's way of life for years, you've basically internalized the truth or a great degree of the truth in your own life. And you can give an answer for the hope that lies within you. You have a whole life experience to draw upon. This is what Barclay says later on in his commentary about uh, 1 Peter 3.15. He says, The only compelling argument is the argument of the Christian life. Let a man so act that his conscience is clear. Let him meet criticism with a life which is beyond reproach. Such conduct will silence slander and disarm criticism. A saint, as someone has said, is someone whose life makes it easier to believe in God. Does your life make it easier for someone else to believe in God? We know that we all make mistakes. The patriarchs made mistakes. The apostles made mistakes. We thank God that he does not charge our iniquities or write them down in stone because we have a repentant attitude. and We repent of our mistakes and are willing to change and to grow and to overcome. So... We want to understand that we know, we must know what we believe. Now, let's look at four different questions that you might be asked. Can you give an answer? What if a neighbor or a religious stranger knocked on your door or a relative or a friend asked you a question? How will you answer? How will you handle it? Uh, some de- time ago, my brother-in-law and my wife actually got into a discussion when we were visiting their home in uh, Arizona. They were talking about the Gulf War. And uh, it was just an interesting discussion. My wife really held her, her part, did very well. I got into the fray once in a while. But some religions argue for a just war. But how will you answer questions that are asked by your friends or relatives or even strangers? Let's consider four questions that you might be asked. Number one, 
Are you a Christian? I think, well, you've never been asked that. Do you love Jesus? Ooh, that uh, causes cringes for some people. What is a Christian, and are you saved? So how would you answer the questioner if the religious stranger was knocking on your door? How would you answer a hostile member or a former member of a church of God? How would you answer your boss, or how would you answer your teacher? Let's turn to Matthew, the 10th chapter. One principle gives us that Jesus gave us in answering questions is given here in Matthew 10 and verse 16. Matthew 10 and verse 16. Jesus said, Behold to his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And yes, it can be quite a uh, warlike atmosphere sometimes. So he said, Be you therefore wise as serpents, and harmless as doves. You need to be able to answer questions with wisdom. And again, be, as he says, be harmless as doves. I have to pray for that ability. And you can too. You can pray for wisdom. So how would you answer the question, are you a Christian? You're asked by a friendly stranger. How would you answer? Think, well, no one's ever asked me that question. Well, when I gave a version of this sermon in Ashboro just a few weeks ago, uh, one lady after services said, well, I was just in the, the feed store. She has, uh, lives out in a farm, and one of our housewives, she takes care of uh, farm animals, and she was into a country store, and she bought some feed, and she was going through the check line, and they uh, went ahead and gave her the bill, and just as she was leaving, she said, uh, the clerk said, are you a Christian? So how do you think you would answer? Well, this lady said, yes. And that's all she said as an answer. And the clerk seemed to be, oh, well, that's good. You know, she was very happy. So sometimes the answer is very simple. Matthew 5, verse 33 affirms that approach. Matthew 5, verse 33, again, you have heard that has been said by them of old time, you shall not forswear yourself, but you shall perform unto the Lord your oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Verse 37 of Matthew 5. But let your communication be yes, yes, no, no. For whatsoever is more than these comes of evil. In other words, you need to be convicted about what you believe. Now, obviously, there are some questions that cannot be answered by yes or no, but need uh, qualifications to those. But in this case, it was a very simple yes. So there are different ways of answering. And just uh, last Sunday, my wife was in a natural food store, and a bread delivery man was trying to sell my wife on the benefits of his bread. There, she smiled, she listened patiently to him, and as she was about to leave, he asked, are you a Christian? That's here in North Carolina. And she said, yes, I am. And he said, that's good. I thought so. And that was quite a compliment, you know, because uh, obviously she, her smile and patient listening uh, communicated something to him. And he said, I thought so. Well, there are different ways of answering. You can say, yes, I am. Or you can be more absolute as some of our People are, absolutely I am. You know, some of us are more aggressive or more emotional in our expression. Or you can tell your own personal experience, which I have on the telecast often. Uh, not often, but on uh, some occasions, about 1959, when I just felt that the world was coming to an end and the Soviet Union and the United States were headed for a nuclear holocaust. And I thought there was no hope in the world, no hope whatsoever. And I even thought about suicide, but I, that thought vanished because I knew that was wrong in terms of godly principles, and I had to hope against hope. And God opened the door of my Hearing the World Tomorrow program and uh, writing in for Plain Truth magazine. I've probably told you the story before, but I, I just was lonely, and I wanted to get something free. I wanted to get mail, and so I just heard the word mag is free magazine, box 111, Pasadena, California, and just put the little note in my, my uh, desk and forgot about it. And later I was cleaning out my desk. Oh, there's something else I can get free and wrote that in. And 
Soon I started getting the Plain Truth magazine starting in January 1960. And when I started going to graduate school at Yale University in the fall of 1960, my pastor at the church says, I want you to teach 8th grade Sunday school class. So I started teaching 8th grade Sunday school, and I finally found out that really the teaching materials were really not very good. And so I thought, where can I get something of value? And I got the Plain Truth magazine, and Mr. Meredith had his series on the Ten Commandments. And I started teaching my 8th grade Sunday school class the Ten Commandments from Mr. Meredith's series in the Plain Truth magazine. And that began to open my eyes. I won't tell you the rest of the story, but we all have our own unique story how God has called us into the truth. So someone else might say, well, are you a Christian? And uh, you might say, well, I, I don't know. I, 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 I guess so. Uh, those are defensive answers, and you don't want to be defensive you want to be able to answer, as Jesus said, let your yes be yes or your no, no. Turn to Matthew 21, verse 23. Now, sometimes there may be more of an aggressive, critical question that's asked you. How do you answer those? Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 23. When Jesus came into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? So they were asking him a challenging question. Sometimes you may be asked a challenging question. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. So the question Jesus asked was the baptism of John. Where did it come from? From heaven or from men? They reasoned with themselves, saying, Well, if we say from heaven, he will say, Then why don't you believe me? But if we say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. Verse 27, They answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So how did Jesus answer that challenging question? With a question. And sometimes that's an appropriate way to answer someone who is aggressive or criticizing. Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, gives us another way of answering. Proverbs 26. And sometimes we have learned with some of the questions we get or criticisms that sometimes it's an honest criticism and we can help the person by answering in a reasoned way. At other times we've discovered that the person is not reasonable and whatever type of reasoning you try to help that person one with, it comes back in your face. And it's almost uh, trying to discern, as Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. And so it takes wisdom to know when to answer and when not to answer, as we read here in Proverbs 26, verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you also be like him, like unto him. So there's a time not to answer. I remember one time when my college friend back home in uh, Connecticut and we were out going somewhere in a car and I said something really foolish or silly, he just ignored me. And I thought, oh, okay, I better not be silly or foolish uh, in his presence anymore. So there's a time not to answer a fool. But then there is a time. Verse 5, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So sometimes there is a way and a time to convict someone who is acting foolishly or has a foolish approach. Our attitude, of course, in answering must be in faith. Let's turn to Mark, the 8th chapter. Mark 8. Are you ashamed of Jesus Christ? In other words, if someone were to ask you, are you a Christian, are you all nervous about it? You say, what, 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 what do you mean? Uh, what, 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 what do you mean a Christian? You know, there's no reason in the world that any of us should ever be defensive or nervous. So Jesus tells us here in Mark 8 and uh, verse 38, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So 
we need to be careful how we answer. We don't want to be ashamed, but at the same time, we don't want to come across as hostile or arrogant. Well, let me tell you. You ask me if I'm a Christian. Well, I'll tell you, these millions of so-called Christians in this world are no more converted than a tadpole. No, you have to be careful how you answer. You know? the, uh, again, Barclay says this in terms of our attitude in, in answering. Page 231. He says, the one who answers for the hope that lies within him, his defense must be given with gentleness. There are many people who state their beliefs with a kind of arrogant belligerence. Their attitude is that anyone who does not agree with them is either a fool or a knave, and they seek to ram their beliefs down other people's throats. The case for Christianity must be presented with winsomeness and with love and with the wise tolerance which realizes that it is not given to any man to possess the whole truth. He goes on to say, men are wooed into the Christian faith when they cannot be bullied into it. And then he uh, goes on to say here in the terms of our attitude, his defense must be given with reference. Remember in 2 Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, he says, do it with meekness and fear or respect. And so Barclay writes, his defense must be given with reverence. That is to say, any argument in which the Christian is involved must be carried on in a tone which God can hear with joy. No debates have been so acrimonious as theological debates. No differences have, been caused, have caused such bitterness as religious differences. In any presentation of the Christian case and in any argument for the Christian faith, the accent must be the accent of love. Well, again, this is in the context of 1 Peter 3.15. Let's keep that in mind on how we answer. So if someone asks you the question, are you a Christian, what will you answer? Of course, you can check our booklet on just what is a true Christian. Question number two is, do you love Jesus? And I've seen other members be asked this question. And some of you might be offended because it sounds so Protestant-like. You know, do you love Jesus? Now, there are several ways of asking that question, but give the questioner in general the benefit of the doubt. Not all of them are CIA agents uh, out to get you. Um, discern the questioner's attitude. It's like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 21 and 22, that he became all things to all men. He discerned where are they coming from. And I'll try to answer their question once I know the way they're, from which they're coming. Now, you could also ask the question, why do you love Jesus? Now, there are several ways of answering it. I think probably uh, one of us, depending on the person's attitude of uh, questioning, might say, well, which Jesus are you talking about? Are you talking about the Jesus that did away with the Ten Commandments, did away with his Father's Commandments? Now, that would, you want to hold that one in reserve. That wouldn't be your prime answer necessarily. But you can always answer simply yes. That is, if you believe that, you might have an even more passionate response. But before you respond to someone, and that's why I am giving you this encouragement, you need to ask these questions to yourself. Ask this question to yourself. Do you love the true Jesus of the Bible? Now, you may want to rephrase the question. You want to say, well, do you love your Savior? Do you love your Lord? Do you love your great high priest in heaven? Do you love the true Jesus Christ of the Bible? You know what you were like before God called you. Maybe you grew up in the church, but some of us did not. And I remember asking one student at Ambassador College when we were discussing the proofs of God, God's existence, what proves to you? Don't just give the seven traditional proofs of God's existence. What proves to you personally that God exists? And the student answered, he said, well, I know God exists because if he didn't call me and if I didn't make changes in my life, I would be dead now. I know God exists because I see the evidence in the change in my own life. Well, that's the kind of answer we need to know that it's from the heart and that it's from your own character and from your own experience and your own knowledge. 
I could say something very similar. I, I, if God hadn't called me, I would either be dead or in prison by now, knowing myself. Now, you didn't know me before then. And you also know, well, why do you love the true Jesus of the Bible? Well, because he shed his blood for me. And had he not covered my sins with his blood, I would be dead for all eternity. Why do I love him? Because I belong to him. He's bought and paid for me. He's the Passover who was sacrificed for me. That's why I love him. And you express it in your own way. Think about it. Let's turn to uh, Romans 5, verse 8 to give you a, a biblical answer to the question. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved, notice the future tense there, from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, Romans 5.10, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And we can turn to Galatians 2.20, that we are crucified with Christ. Or John 3.16, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Why, or do you even, have an adoration, and an awe, and a commitment, and a deep love towards your Savior? I've read this before, but it's always moving to me. Sometimes we feel emotions, and there are times when we can't express ourselves in words, and yet, as Barclay brings out, we need to be able to think how to express ourselves intelligently and reasonably. But here's Elizabeth Barrett Browning in her love letter to her husband. She lived 1806 to 1861. And she expresses love this way. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Just a beautiful expression. The Psalms express David's love towards God. We need to express our love personally, heartfeltly, individually. But let me ask you, can you express in a few words, your own words, your adoration, your commitment, your love, your passion for God the Father and your Savior? Some of you who are not here last uh, couple weeks ago, I would encourage you to review Mr. Meredith's sermon on the first great commandment, which is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And let me ask you, can you say, or have you said, and I hope all of you have, out of just not external pressure, but because of your own personal feelings, that you've said simply to God the Father, and you said simply to your Lord and Savior, I love you. Have you ever done that? I hope you do and will do it. But it has to come again out of a pure heart and a meaningful heart. Question two was, do you love Jesus? Question three is, what is a Christian? The standard answer is one who follows Christ. Well, what is the Bible definition? Romans 8 and verse 9. There are many scriptures we could turn to, but Romans 8 and verse 9 tells us, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. In other words, a Christian is one in whom the Spirit of Christ dwells. Or the Spirit of Christ is the same as the Spirit of God. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, 1 John 2, 6, let's take a quick look at some of these scriptures. Uh, 1 John 2, verse 6, he that says he abides in him, that is, he that says I'm a Christian, I'm abiding in Christ, 
ought also to walk even as he, Christ, walked. So we live the example of Christ. We follow his example. We walk in his way. One other scripture that gives a perspective on what a Christian is, and of course I hope you have our booklet and have read it, What is a True Christian? We had a letter come in just this past week as you're turning to John the 8th chapter that uh, was just very appreciative of Mr. Meredith's booklet on what is a true Christian. He was very moved by it and got some answers that he didn't get elsewhere. John 8 and verse 31. Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So a true Christian is one who follows in the words of Christ, continues in it, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Those help us to define what a true Christian is. Of course, we know what a Christian is not. I won't turn there, but you're familiar with Luke 6.46. Why call you me Lord and do not what I tell you? As it says in the NRSV, Luke 6.46. In Matthew 7.21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now, a true Christian is, of course, going to be doing the work that Christ commissioned the church to accomplish. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, where he said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. And he said, Baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So again, I refer you to our website where we have our mission as part of the website page on the lcg.org website. So question number five was, uh, question number three, sorry, was what is a Christian? Number four is, are you saved? How many of you have ever, can I see your hands, how many of you have ever been asked this question? Oh, wow, quite a few hands. I was surprised at how many uh, people have been asked that question. Let's turn to uh, Titus 3 and verse 4. How would you answer that question? How did you answer that question? Titus 3 and verse 4. And you say, no, I've not been saved. Is that how would you answer it? Well, uh, I think you better read again what it says in Titus 3 verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which He shed on us through the, abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So how would you answer that question? When I said I gave a version of this sermon in Ashborough a few weeks ago, one of our senior citizens afterwards uh, told me uh, he was asked that question. You know, have you been saved? He said the previous week he'd been out working in his yard. He was uh, mowing the lawn. It was hot. And he was perspiring. And he was near a main uh, highway. And someone stopped, saw him, and you know, asked him a question. He said, well, where is the, um, the uh, salvage yard? And uh, the gentleman didn't understand salvage yard, so what do you mean? So, well, where's the junkyard? Oh, yes, well, I know where that is. That's just over the hill. And so after our senior citizen gave him the directions to the junkyard, the, the man said, are you saved? And our senior citizen answered, he said, well, really, my priority right now is just to make it through the day. <laughs> Oh, I thought he gave a pretty good answer under the circumstances where he's perspiring, mowing the lawn out in the hot sun. <clears throat> Let's turn to 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, 2 Corinthians 2. Now, I was asked that, I've told you before, but uh, my uh, friend in high school, and we were both seniors, we played basketball together at his church gymnasium, and I was over at his home one time, and uh, 
we were downstairs, and he said, well, Dick, uh, uh, can you come up to my room? I just want to ask you a question. So we went up to his room, and he said, Dick, are you saved? And I said, well, what do you mean? Uh, he said, well, if you were to die tonight, do you believe you'll go to heaven? And I said, yes. And that ended our, he didn't get a chance to save me. The problem was I didn't really know the truth at that time, and I was just oblivious, and, you know, I thought everything's hunky-dory until God called me and showed me differently. But here in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 15, For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Now, that's in the King James, but the New King James has it more correct. Has it correct, I should say. Now thanks to, be God, to God who always leads us in triumph, that's verse 14 in Christ, and that's just an amazing verse all of itself, and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 2, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. Present progressive tense, we are in the process of being saved, and among those who are perishing, New King James Version. So there is the case where we have been saved, are being saved, and Romans 5.10, I already read uh, Romans 5.10, uh, where he says, If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. What are we saved for in the past? From the death penalty. In the context, remember that I read to you in Titus 3.4, it is in the context of baptism. And you have the death penalty removed because you've accepted the shed blood of Christ and now you are saved from your past sins, not from all your future sins. Well, that takes more qualification, which I won't go into. But nonetheless, you are justified, which is the main context. We already read that in Titus as well. You're justified, made right with God from all your past sins. You now can start to walk in newness of life as it says in Romans, the sixth chapter, after you come up out of the water, symbolic of the resurrection and the baptism, of course, that takes place. So if someone were to ask you the common question, are you saved? A truly converted Christian could answer, I have been justified, redeemed, or saved from my past sins. I am now being saved as I grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ, and I shall ultimately be saved by Christ's life, as we read in those scriptures. Of course, Matthew 14, uh, 24, 13 says, He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. So how can we always be ready to give an answer? We've took, taken a look at four questions, but I want to, in closing, just give you five quick points of how to always be ready. Romans 4, verse 21 if we're going to be ready to give a reason of the hope that lies within us, we need to have hope. We need to have faith. And so Abraham is the father of the faithful. And in Romans 4, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Now, are you strong in faith or are you weak in faith? It doesn't say he was weak in faith. It says he was strong in faith. Why? Because he was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, as you know in Romans 10 and verse 17. So it's so important to be reading the Bible regularly, and God will bring to your remembrance what he's spoken unto you through the Holy Spirit, as it says in John 14, verse 26. And we need to be positive to be able to share our faith, to share our hope. It says in uh, Philippians 4.4, 4, Rejoice in the Lord. And again I say rejoice. And you know Philippians 4.8, that whatsoever things are true and noble, just, pure, lovely, of a good report, if there's any virtue or anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things or think on these things. So number one in always being able to give an answer for the hope, we must have hope and must have faith is number one. Number two, we must know what we believe. 
Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. So how can you believe the gospel unless you've heard the gospel? So understand what the gospel is. Now, I encourage you to write your own fundamentals of belief. Back in the summer educational program years ago, I gave some of the students an opportunity to write what they believe. And this is from a 16-year-old. So listen what this 16-year-old writes in her belief. I believe. I believe there is a God who created everything and will forgive us of our sins if we repent. I believe in the seven laws of success and the Ten Commandments, because that's what I was teaching at the summer educational program, seven laws of success and the Ten Commandments. I believe if you do not obey God, you will not make it to the place of safety. I believe there is a place of safety and that God's chosen people will make it. Well, there's more qualifications to that. But anyway, she has uh, some fundamental beliefs. She goes on to say, I believe Christ is going to return to the earth and bring with him his government and his way of teaching that the whole world may change and go the way of God. I believe in the millennium. and Those who are baptized will help run it and we will all live in peace. I believe the end is near and that there will be a World War III which will destroy the earth and then God will bring it all to stop and then there will be only one war left and that is one between God and Satan. Again, a little more qualification may be needed. I believe Christ died for our sins and that through Him dying all may be given another chance, a chance to repent and be forgiven. If He had not died for our sins, we would all come short of the glory of God. I believe there is a devil who is of the way of get and not give, who is the leader of all the world except for those in God's church, and also that his way is wrong and that Christ's is the right way. I believe in what the Bible teaches and that it is the basis on which to live. I believe God's way is the only way to live and that you must pray and fast and study so you may stay in close contact with God. This is from a 16-year-old. Now, I hope that all of you who are adults could write something even as meaningful and as heartfelt as that. We must know what we believe. What true knowledge is a part of your character and your heart and your mind? What truths have you internalized and made a part of your very nature, which is part of the intention of the sermonette we heard today? At Ambassador College was the cornerstone. The Word of God is the foundation of knowledge. Again, I refer you to the official statement of beliefs to help you to know what even the church believes. I, when, I, when I was in the mainstream church years ago, I asked the pastor, well, what does the church believe? I don't even know what I'm supposed to believe here in the church. And he started a series which told about the founder of the church back in England and, you know, the uh, 16th century. And I never really did find out what the church believed. Now, I did, you've all heard the song, I believe, I put into the search engine, Google, uh, I believe, and, and so I didn't get the I believe lyrics I wanted. It came up, Aventura, I believe lyrics, and it says, I believe you will end up alone. Oh, and then it goes into a Spanish, <laughs> Ivas e extrana, mi lindo amor. I believe my love will always be in your heart, pero será muy tarde corazón. Anyway, uh, that's not the song I wanted. <laughs> But I think you're familiar with the song that uh, was sung years ago and I was singing it in the shower this morning. Uh, um, I believe for every drop of rain that falls, a flower grows. I believe that somewhere in the darkest night, a candle glows. I believe for everyone who goes astray, someone will come to show the way. I believe, yes, I believe. I believe above the storm, the smallest prayer will still be heard. I believe that someone in the great somewhere hears every word. Every time I hear a newborn baby cry or touch a leaf or see the sky, then I know why I believe. Now that's very poetic and artistic and uh, may not be literal in every case, but nonetheless, we need to know what we believe. That's very important. We need to seek God's wisdom, and that's the wisdom from above, as it says in James, the third chapter, 
As we read in Matthew 10, verse 16, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's number three, we must seek God's wisdom. Number four, we must be filled with the Spirit, as it tells us in Ephesians 5, and verse 18. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. If you're going to be able to give an answer, then you need to be filled with the Spirit. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 12, and I won't turn there. The Holy Spirit shall teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. That is, when you are under interrogation or you're brought before the magistrates, he said, don't think in your heart ahead of time what to say, but the Holy Spirit will help you to give the, the answer. Number four is we must be filled with the Spirit. Number five, we must have a fervent love for God the Father and His Son. I've already emphasized that point, but let's turn to John, the 21st chapter. John 21. Remember when Jesus was testing Peter after Jesus' resurrection, Peter had betrayed Jesus. And Jesus had predict, predicted that Peter would deny him three times. So here in John 21, verse 15, So when they had dined, this is after the resurrection, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, love you more than these? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, Feed my lambs. He asked him a second time. And he says, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Now he asked him the third time. Jesus changed the verb. It was more of the deeper love. And then he said, well, you love me as a friend. And the third time, well, Lord, Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, love you me? Verse 17. So what if Jesus were to ask you, as he asked Peter three times, do you love me more than these? How would you answer? How strong is your faith? How strong is your belief, your knowledge of the truth? And how strong will you be answering and defending your belief? The Apostle John completed the book of Revelation. He had a disciple named Polycarp, and you can read about it in God's Church Through the Ages. Polycarp is mentioned several times. I'll refer you to page uh, 10 and page 11, in which Irenaeus records that Polycarp had traveled to Rome in the mid-2nd century to try to persuade Anicetus, bishop of Rome, of the true time of the Passover. Anicetus claimed to have been bound by the tradition of his predecessors since Bishop Sixtus, while Polycarp declared he, that is Polycarp, had always observed it, the Passover, with John, the disciple of our Lord, and the rest of the apostles with whom he associated. That's from Eusebius, uh, Roman numeral 24, small caps. After 50 years after Poly, about 50 years after Polycarp's journey, Victor of Rome sought to intimidate the churches of Asia Minor into conforming to the Roman Easter practice. And then there's a quote from uh, Polycrates. You may or may not be familiar with Polycarp, but I would again encourage you to read about him and what he taught here in God's church through the ages. But there was a letter from the church at Smyrna the brethren had observed his martyrdom. And it's recorded in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1. I want to read excerpts from that letter from the brethren of Smyrna as they wrote to another Church of God group recorded in history. And this is the, called The Letter of the Smyrnaeans or the Martyrdom of Polycarp. And this is Section 9.1. But as Polycarp entered into the stadium, he was captured give you a little background, he was captured and brought into the stadium at Smyrna where the big crowds, they had already had lions eating up the, the Christians, they put the lions away and now Polycarp is brought into the stadium and a voice from heaven came to him, be strong Polycarp and play the man. And no one saw the speaker but those of our people who were present heard the voice and at length when he was brought up there was a great tumult for they heard that Polycarp had been apprehended. The crowd was just, just happy that here this Christian had been arrested. When then he was brought before him, the proconsul inquired whether he were the man. And on his confessing that he was indeed Polycarp, he tried to persuade him to a denial, saying, Have respect to your age and other things in accordance therewith. As it was their wont to say, Swear by the genius of Caesar, repent and say, Away with the atheists. 
Of course, what they're trying to say away with the atheists is a criticism against Christians. Then Polycarp, with a solemn countenance, looked upon the whole multitude of lawless heathen that were in the stadium and waved his hand to them, and groaning and looking up to heaven, he said, Away with the atheists! 9.3, But when the magistrate pressed him hard and said, Swear the oath and I will release you. Revile the Christ. Polycarp said, How would you answer? Polycarp said, Four score and six years have I been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But on his persisting again and saying, Swear by the genius of Caesar, he said, If you suppose vainly that I will swear by the genius of Caesar as you say, and feign that you are ignorant who I am, hear you plainly, I am a Christian. But if you would learn the doctrine of Christianity, assign a day and give me a hearing. In other words, I'll, I'll help you learn what Christianity is all about. I'll skip down. Saying these things and more, he was inspired with courage and joy, and his countenance was filled with grace. He's about to be put to death now. So that not only did it not drop in dismay at the things which were said to him, but on the contrary, the proconsul was astounded and sent his own herald to proclaim three times in the midst of the stadium, Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. Hopefully that would be the same for us. When this was proclaimed by the herald, the whole multitude, both of Gentiles and of Jews, who dwelt in Smyrna, cried out with ungovernable wrath and with a loud shout, This is the teacher of Asia. Here are the heathen going to pronounce their criticism of Polycarp. This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the puller down of our gods, who teaches numbers not to sacrifice nor worship. Saying these things, they shouted aloud and asked the Asiarch Philip, to let a lion loose upon Polycarp, but he said that it was not lawful for him since he had brought the sports to a close. So they got him to a pillar and got to what were called all the uh, wood around and burn him to burn him at the stake. And uh, he refused to be nailed. He said he would just stand there. They tied him to the stake. Then he, placing his hands behind him, and being bound to the stake like a noble ram out of a great flock for an offering, a burnt sacrifice, made ready and acceptable to God, looking up to heaven said, and here's his last prayer, O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received the knowledge of you, the God of angels and powers and of all creation and of the whole race of the righteous who live in your presence, I bless you for that you have granted me this day and hour that I might receive a portion amongst the number of martyrs in the cup of your Christ under resurrection of eternal life, in the incorruptibility of the Holy Spirit, both of soul and of body. May I be received among these in your presence this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as you did prepare and reveal it beforehand and have accomplished it. You are the faithful and true God. For this cause, yes, and for all things, I praise you, I bless you, I glorify you, through the eternal and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom with him and the Holy Spirit be glory both now and ever and for the ages to come. And then in Polycarp 16, 2, it concludes, In the number of these was this man, this glorious martyr Polycarp, who was found an apostolic and prophetic teacher in our own times, a bishop of the Holy Church, which is in Smyrna. For every word which he uttered from his mouth was accomplished and will be accomplished. So brethren, over the millennia, thousands of prophets, saints, patriarchs, men and women of faith have died in the faith. Polycarp, the saints, the faithful servants of Christ have given an answer. They've given a defense of their hope, our hope. We all have a great hope in the resurrection we have a vision for the second coming and the kingdom of God that's coming. Brethren, can you give an answer for the hope that lies within you? If you've been living God's way of life for one month, one year, or ten years, you can give an answer. If you believe the Bible and want to live by it, you can give an answer. 
If you know what you believe, you can give an answer. If you have God's Spirit flowing out from you, renewing it every day, you can give an answer. If you are doing God's work and His will, you can give an answer. Brethren, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer, a defense, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that lies within you and do it with meekness and fear.